So tonight we're going to be looking at Pergamum. And if at any, if any point, it was Pergamum, Pergamon, Pergamos. It's interchangeable. I've seen it a lot of different ways. If at any point you have a question or a comment, feel free to ask or say that. So like we've been doing, I'm going to give you a little bit of history of Pergamos, Pergamon. Because I really think that the history of every place kind of gives some insight onto what's going on in those areas. So Pergamum, uh, the name itself means height, elevation, primary, utmost, of first class courage. There's a lot of different meanings I've found of that. It's modern day Bergama, Turkey. But Pergamum itself is ruins. The interesting thing about Pergamum is that it, it was built upon a top of a 1,100 foot high Acropolis. It's this big rock that stands out in the middle of a plain, and that's where they built it at. It's an ancient city from just after the flood of, of Noah. There were many people who were living in that area. Uh, you can go back into history and see all of that that goes on. Um, legendarily, it was founded by Telephus who was a son of Hercules. Um, There are a lot of uh, history that goes back into that 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 people question. Is this real? Is it not real? But there's a lot of cities that claim to be uh, founded by children of Hercules. And he must have been prolific because there's a bunch bunch of his kids, a bunch of his descendants. And you can imagine that's probably true in some ways or another, another sort. Pergamos was also a grandson of Achilles. And so when we look at some of these characters that we think that's mythological, it, some of it may be mythological, but a lot of those people and names and places and dates and happenings are based on real people that actually lived. Now, we're, we didn't live back then. We can't prove that. But there's a reason why those stories exist. It's not like what we're talking about with some of the made-up stories that people write today. I mean, some of these things are probably embellishments, but they're probably truth in some of the respects that the people were real people. At any rate, uh, it later became the residence of the Adelid dynasty. And this is where it was really kind of at its highest between 281 and 133 BC. It was their treasury. That's where they kept all their gold. Uh, Lysimachus had his treasury there, and then he passed on that. Uh, Lysimachus was uh, one of the people who came after Alexander the Great. After Alexander the Great died, his kingdom split into four parts. And there was warring factions between a lot of his generals. Lysimachus was one of those generals. The Adelids lived there. Their, their, their dynasty lasted for a pretty good long time. And interestingly enough, the Adelids claimed direct lineage to Hercules. This is a big deal for those in those Greek areas. They wanted to have a direct lineage to the legendary characters and say, look, there's a reason why we're, we're here. It's because this is family land. So when you think about like the, the, the legendary histories of different royal lineages in our own day, you can look at the royal lineage of King Charles, who's going to be you know, put on, officially on the throne and all that here coming up. They claim lineage to King David, <laughs> of all people, and even further than that. So you think about that. There, there are reasons why they have those genealogies, and they go back that far. Of course, we can't, we can't prove any of that. They're just, they're just in their histories. But they're there for a reason. After the Adelid dynasty came and went, it was given to Rome. It became a Roman colony. And when it became a Roman colony, it it became the the capital of the province of Asia, Asia Minor. It covered all of western Turkey, except for the coastal towns of like Ephesus and Smyrna. It became a metropolis, which was a huge uh, city um, and and a title given to it under Hadrian. Uh, and it had a, at that point, this was in a 100, 280, it had a greater status than Ephesus or Smyrna that we've already looked at. It was a place to be reckoned with in some respects. There was an economic collapse that we're about to go through as well here in the United States. There was an economic collapse in the 3rd century BC that uh, was subsequently followed up by a, an earthquake in 262 AD. Then it was sacked by the Goths shortly afterwards. And it you know, went into ruins and people lived in and out of the area. They didn't live right up on the Acropolis, but they lived down in the valley along the river. Um, all the way up to modern days, it's changed hands multiple times. And so the history has gone back and forth. What is it known for? It's known, of course, for the treasury of Lysimachus, uh, it was, it was, which was built on top of this Acropolis. Um, It's known for parchment. We talked about that. Parchment is a a corruption of the word pergamum. It's where there was actually a, um, a, you know, you had the the Library of Alexander. 
Alexandria that had tons of books. And all of those books were written on papyrus, papyrus. Well, the, the, the Library of Alexandria and, and Egypt kept that technology secret. They did not share their papyrus with everybody else. So other places had to find other means of writing down books and letters and all of that. And so this was an area that they used parchment. They'll claim that parchment came from Pergamos, but that's not true. It was just made popular in its usage at Pergamos because their library had 200,000 volumes. I don't know how many volumes that the uh, Library of Alexandria had, but the battle between those two libraries was, was so great that uh, the leading figures in Pergamos tried to entice away one of the librarians at Alexandria and tried to bribe him with tons of money. And of course, he didn't choose to go with that. But it is known, of course, for a lot of temples. It was built to be a second Athens. And you can imagine, just even in the Bible, it talks about people worshiping on high places. When you have an 1,100 foot high monolith you know, hill out in the middle of a, of a plain down by a river, you're going to find all sorts of things. A number of years ago, I was in Belize, and we decided to go to Chichen Itza. And it's, you're driving along, it's all flat, and all of a sudden, there's this big hill that rises up in the middle of this plain, and on top of that hill is where their temple complex was, and it's a massive temple complex. And we climbed, me and a friend of mine, we climbed to the top of Chichen Itza, and we could see the Pacific Ocean. We could see the Atlantic Ocean. We could see you know, Belize, of course, but you can see Honduras and Guatemala and you can see temples all around in other places. Uh, one of the things that was on top of that mountain was the altar of Zeus, which is figuratively applied in this passage as the seat of Satan. That altar was rediscovered in the 1800s and smuggled, I don't know how, but they smuggled it out of Turkey and brought it to Berlin. So they brought it to Germany in the late 1800s. It was used by Hitler. When you look at the altar of Zeus, um, and it's not, you really can't see it. This is, this is a ruins of something else. You can look it up on the internet and you can see what it looks like. It's, it's this huge, huge thing. Stairs and columns all over the place. The symbolism itself was used by Hitler in his own kingdom of Germany. But it was also used by an American president in his inauguration. The symbolism of it was used by Barack Obama in his inauguration. So you can look at the backdrop of his inauguration and it looks like the temple of Zeus. Now Zeus would be the chief of the Greek gods. He would be Satan, so to speak, as opposed to the one true God. Uh, it's now currently in a, in a Berlin museum, but it has been, the, the exhibit has been closed for the past decade. And they're surmising that it's actually being prepared to return to Pergamos, to, per to Pergamum, and to be rebuilt there so that the Antichrist can set up his kingdom out of, the, um, out of Istanbul and all of that where the, uh, you know, the caliphate would be at. So who knows? I don't know. I can't say that it will, but you never know. But it's, the symbolism has been used by other people as well. There were other there were other altars there too, other temples, Athena, Artemis, Trajan, who was a Roman emperor. They had the Roman emperor, emperor worship there too. There was a huge Asclepion, which was a healing place with the, with the healing snakes. You know, could you imagine spending a night with snakes? It probably wouldn't be a good idea. It became a huge spa where people would go to try to find help for their ailments. Um, interesting enough, that there are some uh, vaccines that we use today that are based on snake venom. So that's where some vaccines that we even use today are from. So, and that, and like the snake symbol on our medical thing is where that's where that right. It's the, it's the rod of Escaplia. That that's God that they thought was their healer. Right, and he was known as the healer or the savior. Yeah, and he was the, he was a snake. Right. So, okay. Right, right. So, um, you know, uh, I, I'm sure they weren't venomous snakes that they had down. There. Who knows what they were? <laughs> they might have had pit vipers. I don't know, but you know, you can imagine they they go down into this pit. Uh, they'd hang out with the snakes and sleep until they had some sort of a vision. And then they would, you know, explain the vision to the attending physician and the physician would come up with some sort of a way to help them out. Uh, it sounds weird to us, but that's how they did their medicine. And, you know, one of the, one of the great ancient physicians, uh, other than, you know, we know the Hippocratic Oath, the, the other great ancient histor uh, historical physician was a guy named Galen. He trained 
in Ephesus, not in Ephesus, in Pergamon, in the Escapulion there. So he, he, was, he was very, very smart as far as physical, physical ailments and all that goes. But, you know, you think about the history of that. Uh, of course, you had Hera, Demeter, and other ones. But it was also, because of that, a center of idolatry. With all of those temples and with everything else going on there, you can imagine just the crazy things that were happening. A center of idolatry. It was a center of mystery religions and demonic activity. There was even a place of, of Mithraism there. Mithra was a bull god worshipped in Persia. Mithras was a bull god worshipped in Rome. Rome got it from Persia. That got it from Babylon. Uh, the, the, the worship of the bull goes back a long way. Our, even our modern day rodeo has in some respect a heralding back to that time where people were bullfighting and you know, the Minoans were jumping over bulls. What kind of image did the Israelites make in the, in the wilderness when they had, you know, when Moses was up on the mountain, he was a bull. So you had this whole thing with the bull going on. Uh, Mithraism was a secret initiation mystery religion. It had seven levels that you had to work your way through. And you could only, you could only work through them and you could only learn the passwords and secrets and handshakes and all of the things that went, symbolism went with it as you were trusted with it. Second century BC, there was a Mithra, the bull slayer statue that was made in Pergamos, Pergamum. So even in the uh, like 100 AD, 100 BC, somewhere in that range, there were some coins that had Mithra's image on it in Pergamum. Um, it itself, uh, Mithra, Mithra had a crown on him like the Statue of Liberty, this pointed crown that just had spires coming off of that. All of this kind of symbolism goes back to the same thing. And if you're paying attention to it, you'll see it out in society where everybody else looks at it and goes, well, whatever that is. You know, I see it all over the place. I've been an artist for a long time. I make signs. I see signs. I see symbolism. And if you know what you're looking at, you can, you can understand exactly what's being spoken by those who put out the symbols. So it's just telling you that it's from... From that, you may have seen a symbol of a snake eating its tail. Probably have seen that in ancient history. That's called the Ouroboros. It's from Mithra. Mithra was a bull god, but there was also the snake and serpent imagery that went with this. It in itself was a, a corruption of zodiac constellation, secret rites, and passwords. And so from this comes the deep things of Satan that would affect Thyatira, which was the next town over. And Thyatira and Pergamum were closely related because both of these claim to be, be founded by children of Hercules. And so their history goes back a long way and there's a tight connection between the two of them. Uh, that, that Mithraism spread wildly among trade guilds, among craftsmen, among soldiers and politicians. And even to this day, there are mystery religions that come out of that kind of stuff that affect what's going on even in our own country. Does that have any connection to the Masonic? Probably does. So that, that probably does. And I think we need to be careful about getting involved with anything that is not from the Scripture. There's a lot of things that claim to be from the Bible that are not from the Bible. They may claim biblical language, but they're not from the Scripture. They may claim biblical symbolism, but they're not from the Scripture. And so we have to be really careful with that. In fact, this letter is about that type of situation that was going on. You can imagine what, what the people were going through, having been raised up in that culture where this was everywhere. It was commonplace. It was accepted. If you didn't do it, you were an outcast. And to come to Christ and Christ being the only true God, everybody else would look at you and go, well, why aren't you doing the things that everybody else is doing? It wouldn't make any sense. It would be far easier to just relax a little bit and accept some of that and bring that into your life with Christ. And that's what some people do. We don't know a lot about the church of Pergamum. This is the only time it's mentioned in the scripture, right here in this place. But we do know uh, about one person from Pergamum because Jesus mentions them in this passage. We know of Antipas. Antipas' name himself, Antipatros, could be for all or against all. Could also mean against the Father. It could also refer to the highest level of initiation in Mithraism. So he may have, there was a there was a Herod whose name was Herod Antipat, Antipas. So that name was pretty common. So there's a lot that goes along with that. 
Uh, Antipas was a disciple of John the Apostle. John the Apostle moved into this area down here in Ephesus. He, he went all the way around this area spreading the gospel and teaching people. He poured into Antipas. Antipas was a faithful witness. He was burned alive on a brazen bull-shaped altar of Artemis for casting out demons that were worshipped by the local pagans. So John went into the temples and cast out those demons. Just as he did in Ephesus, praying against the, uh, the altar there, and the Lord heard his prayer and cast out the demon and the altar broke and all of those things that happened. Those locals got so mad that John was cast, or that Antipas was casting out demons that they burned him alive on a bull-shaped altar. It literally was there. Their, it's just crazy when you think about it. This was AD uh, 92 during the reign of Domitian. So we know about those people, but beyond that, we don't know much else about it. Uh, I've given you in brief everything I know about the city of Pergamum and its church. Are there churches there today? Not in Pergamum, because that city is ruined. But in Bergama, Turkey, which is largely Islamic, there are some churches, Eastern Orthodox and such. Um, but the, the city itself faced this whole downfall shortly after the writing of this letter. The Lord came quickly and judged this place. Because of its sin and idolatry. So let's look into the passage here and then see what the Lord Jesus has to say about it. Revelation 2 chapter or chapter 2 verse 12 says this. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who kept a, teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. Thus you also have some who in the same way hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And I'll explain both of those here in just a minute and how that affected that. Repent, therefore, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. So, Jesus knows exactly what's going on with it. Now, if you look at the chart, that uh, that's probably got that right in there. I don't know what, what dates it gives on that. For Pergamum, you know? Those are just approximate dates. If you were to look back in church history, there was a lot of mystery religions that were coming into the church uh, when the Catholic Church and Roman Empire kind of come together. And the Roman Emperor was like, hey, let's make everything pagan Christian now to make it easier for people to um, come to Christ. You know, so it was very seeker, seeker friendly at that point, And you could easily move back and forth from, from the worship of Roman and Greek gods into Christianity. In fact, when you look at some of the symbolism and stuff that the, the Catholic Church uses, they actually repurposed some of the statues for these other gods and, and uh, said, well, you know, that's not Jupiter anymore, that's Peter, or something like that. And, they, and there's a lot of things like that that have happened. It's nice and easy and very convenient, right? So we're not worshiping Ju Jupiter anymore or Zeus or whatever. It's crazy. But, so, but I think that this letter is actually a specific letter to, that, to this church and what it was struggling with. Because it lived in the place that it was at, and because there was so much idolatry rampant in that city, this was what was affecting the people. Jesus says, I know where you dwell. I know where you live. Jesus knows exactly where they were living, right in the middle of a center of pagan idol worship. If Athens was the chief among the Greek gods, and Pergamos tried to be just like Athens, if it tried to be a second Athens, it would have allowed and pursued and run rampant after any sort of worship and any sort of pagan worship that you could find anywhere 
Mithraism itself, it got it from the east. It brought it over and it's like, hey, let's, let's just join this in together with what we're already doing. You want to worship the, the Caesar? Worship the Caesar. We'll set up a statue of the Caesar. And there was the image of Caesar in a temple there up on top of the mountain. There was all of these things that were going on. Jesus said, I know where you dwell. You dwell in the middle of a city that is full of pagan worship and it's all over the place. I know where you dwell. You dwell where Satan's throne is. And Satan's throne would have been Zeus's altar. It would have been this massive altar worth 24 hours a day. They were doing sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. And when they took those bulls and goats and other things that they would sacrifice and they slaughtered them, what did they do with all the meat? They would take that meat, package it up, bring it down to the marketplace and sell it. Now, if you read your New Testament, you know that Paul talks about that. That we shouldn't eat meat sacrificed to idols. And if you're sitting down with somebody and they say, oh, by the way, that steak right there was offered to Zeus. What you should do, not for your own sake, but for the conscience sake of the other person is say, I appreciate the steak, but I can't eat it. Because it's meat sacrificed to idols. Anything that we pray for, look, uh, and our, our, uh, our USDA prime choice beef is probably not as prime choice as you think it is. <laughs> you know? There's a lot of things that go on in the, in the slaughtering process. But when we pray over it, we're asking God's blessing. And God doesn't miraculously go, woo, and take away all of the disease out of it. But we're thanking God for it and sanctifying it with word of God and prayer. Um, I became convicted of something in particular in regard to that over a couple years ago when I discovered that there was a particular type of meat that is slaughtered in such a way that it is in, in accordance with the rules of Islam so that they would, they would sacrifice that. They would basically slaughter that cow so that it would be not kosher, that's Jewish, but it would be halal meat. You know, halal is the Islamic way of doing it. So I was like, well, you know, do I really want it now? You know, I can, I can go after some other things. Now, I don't, I don't mention that to you to put a burden on you, but I think you, need to, I think you just need to pay attention to what you're eating. Um, and, and, but but there's an issue. That was just an issue. That was just an issue. I don't want to be legalistic about it, but I do want to be, in general, paying attention. You know, we need to pay attention to what's going on. Well, the people who were living in Pergamum knew, hey, This meat may have been sacrificed up on top of that hill on one of these altars somewhere. I mean, it's it's a great way to keep the process going, right? What would they do with all the animals? It's got to go somewhere. And so they were living in this society where all of this was coming down from the top. Literally, coming down from the top of the hill and spreading out into the society where people were living. Jesus says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, but you you hold fast to my name. Jesus' Jesus's compliment is, I know where you dwell, and you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my name. They did not deny the name of Jesus. And even in the midst of, of all of these other names that were being named, they did not deny the name of Jesus, the majority of them. But Jesus' complaint is, I've got some things against you guys. You have people in your city that hold to the teachings of Balaam. What do we know about Balaam? Balaam is found, the story of Balaam is found in Numbers. The children of Israel are going into the promised land. They're on their way to the promised land. They're about to cross over. And Balaam is hired by Balak, who is a local king, who wants him to curse the Israelites, to curse the children of Israel. And they're numerous. They're all over the place. And he would, he, every time he opened his mouth, he would just speak blessing. And it got to the point where Balak was like, look, I, I, I'm paying you to curse him. And, and you keep opening your mouth to, mouth to bless him. And Balaam was like, well, look, I only say the things that God tells me to say. He was a prophet for hire, so to speak. And there are even prophets for hire today to say anything you want him to say. But what Balaam did was subversive beyond this. Yes, he blessed. Yes, he spoke blessing over the children of Israel at the command of the Lord. But after all that was done, he told Balak to deal with the children of Israel in this way. Let them be there. Allow them to be there, but then you need to join with them and use your young women 
to entice them into sexual immorality and you need to get them to join together with you in meals where they can eat meat sacrificed to idols. You need to subvert them. You need to be subtle about it. Join with them. Speak the same language. You know, get to be around them and get to know them as friends and then subtly introduce them into things that they shouldn't be doing and they would go off into immorality. And that's what happened. The scripture records that. Uh, and in fact, there was one young man who brought uh, the daughter of one of the, the chieftains into his tent and, you know, right in front of everybody. And everybody knew what was going on. And, and the high priest runs down and, and pokes a spear through both of them while they're in the act. So, I mean, you know what God's saying there. Don't do that. But they, he, he were being subversive and teaching them to entice the children of Israel into sexual immorality. The teachings of Balaam were idolatry. John says, flee idolatry. And while the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John were not necessarily written to Pergamos, the, the issue of idolatry is all over that. We either serve Jesus or we serve some idol, whatever that idol might be. We're going to serve the Lord or we're not going to serve him at all. So when we start serving other things other than Jesus, we end up serving idols. And that's just the way that is. But Jesus says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. You, did, you held fast to my name. You didn't deny it even when Di- Anabas died. But here's the thing. You have those who hold to the teaching of Balaam. The teaching of Balaam is, yes, you can be a servant of God. You can know Jesus. But you can also join in with this other worship that's going on there. It's not a big deal for you to go up to the temple of Zeus. It's not a big deal for you to go and eat meat, eat meat, uh, meat sacrificed to idols. You can go into the temple of Artemis. You can go into the temple of Apollo. You can go in and get yourself involved with all this pagan worship. It's not that big of a deal. Everybody else is doing it right. You know, you don't want to like make everybody mad at you and make them think that you're, you know, hate everybody. Right, right. So, you know, they want you to tolerate, right? So they were, they were teaching toler- tolerance. Just tolerate them, you know, just be at peace with your neighbors. Why would you want to cause a problem? And many people were falling away to that. And so that was the teachings of Balaam in that Balak uh, was keeping stumbling blocks before Israel. But then he also had the teachings on the Nicolaitans. We talked about that a little bit. But Nicolaite, the Nicolaitan teachings were, again, somewhat in akin with that. There was ritual sex, love feast orgies that was going on in these temples where you would go up and <laughs> that's what they were doing. Everybody was doing it, you know. And they're just having a wild, raucous party. And, and that was being spread among them. Uh, and even the, there's this whole thing with uh, the fornication without shame. It was said that, that Nicholas... Um, you know, would share his wife with others, which sounds crazy to us, but there's a lot of people who do that kind of stuff. It was being spread, and people were following after that. Jesus says, I have this against you. You have people that hold to those things. It's immorality. It's against the Lord. It's wicked behavior. This is the type of behavior that God uh, judged the children in the land of Canaan for. Why did God wait for the children of Israel for the right time for the children of Israel to come and possess the the promised land. The Bible says that the sins of the Canaanites had not yet reached their upper limit. And their limit was they began to fornicate with each other and sexually transmitted diseases were all over the place. They were killing their children and they they were forsaking marriage and going off into all sorts of horrendous lifestyles. And of course, they had all of the gods that they served. Idolatry was everywhere. And so the children of Israel were told to go in and wipe them out. They were told to go in and kill everybody. Because you didn't want that, you didn't want that in your society. And, and, and that's, that's what they should have done. And not only one of them did it. Only one person of the children of Israel fully inherited the land that was given to them. And that was Caleb. Caleb was the only one that 100% obey the Lord. Everybody else had problems because they did not obey the Lord by getting rid of all of the mystery religions and wicked temple worship and things that were against God. They just assimilated that into their culture by tolerating it. All we have to do is tolerate it and it will flourish. It's everywhere now. They said, we just want to get married, right? We just want people to recognize us that we could get married. And next thing you know, we're like, what? I mean, it's just think about how far it's gone in 10 years. And now not just tolerate it, but to give hearty approval. Right. To it. Like, I was, re- you know, I just won't even go into that. I was just, I read a lot of things and I'm like, this, this, this world has gone mad. 
the things that are being accepted in places. Like, it's not even fit to discuss in, in, you know, in, in grown adult conversation, let alone you know, out there on the work side. It's not fit to discuss. We don't even need to talk about it other than to recognize that the worst things that you could possibly imagine are being accepted and pushed. And, you know, before long, you're going you're gonna to see it here in our country. You're already seeing a lot of it, but it's going to get a whole lot worse. It's going to get a whole lot worse. But this is what Jesus had against them. They were accepting idols. They were accepting false gods. They were accepting demonic worship. They were accepting food sacrifice to idols, immorality, fornication, things that, that just should not, be, should not be happening. And so what Jesus says is this, you need to repent quickly because I'm coming. If you don't repent, I'm going to come against you with the sword that's in my mouth. What is the double-edged sword that's in the, in the mouth of Christ? It's the word of God. God's word convicts. God's word is clearly said, God made a male and God made a female. And this is the way you're supposed to live. And this is what marriage is. And this is only what marriage is. And you don't do this. And you, you need to do that. And you need to protect kids. And you don't, need to, you don't need to fool around with these things. So God's word convicts. But God's word also cuts through the society and can chop it down into little pieces. That's what he did. The Lord allowed it to happen and continue for a while. And then he sent economic collapse. And then he sent a physical collapse through an earthquake. And then he sent raiders to come in and destroy the city. And he sent person and group after person and group ever since then. And they've been having problems ever since then. Because they tolerated it. I think, right. What are you doing right now? That's right. And so, when, and so when we as a society see the collapse of... And I think it's coming. And we need to be aware of what's coming. When we see this happening, we need to understand Jesus says, y'all need to repent because I'm coming quickly and I'm going to come with the sword that's in my mouth. So he said, come quickly. I will make war against them with the sword that's in my mouth. Not only is it his word, but he also uses other means spoken of in the Bible. Think about how many times God, God uh, warned the children of Israel and what did God use to chastise the children of Israel? He used war. He used economic collapse. He used natural disasters. He used the enemies to come in and deport the people and crush their society because of their disobedience. Don't be surprised to see that here. We're not Israel. We're not promised anything. But God does judge. God judges because he wants us to live holy lives. He wants us to live holy lives. This is just recognizing Jesus is walking among the lampstands. He's walking amongst his churches and he knows exactly what's going on here and in your homes and in your workplaces and when nobody else is looking, God knows. And so he, he calls to us to repent. That's what his command is, repent. It sounds simple, but it's the most difficult thing to do. So you've got to let it go. We've got to walk away from that stuff. We've got to let it go. And all of the things that are so enticing that the world wants us to follow after are nothing. Nothing compared to what the Lord has. So he says this, look, I'm coming quickly. You need to repent. But here's what the overcomer is going to receive. The one who stands firm with the Lord. The one who, like them, who stood faithful in the days of Antipas. When we overcome by the word of God, when we cling to Jesus and we reject all this worldly nonsense that's just demonic... Jesus says this, I'm going to give you hidden manna. Would you rather have meat sacrificed to idols or the hidden manna that really gives you true life? That meat sacrifice to idols is not going to get you very far. But manna was given by God as provision for the children of Israel in the wilderness. You can have that which fills and, and fills completely and is exactly what you need. Or you can have something that... <laughs> It's not even what it proclaims itself to be. So it's a contrast. You can have one or you can have the other. Jesus says, if you, if you overcome, I'm going to give you hidden manna. But not only this, he says, I'm going to give you a white stone with a new name written on it that nobody knows but you. And I, and I looked really long and hard to figure out what this was all about. 
What's the deal with the white stone? There's a lot there. White is pure. But in court cases, everybody would be given a stone. And they would cast their judgment. Were they guilty? Throw in the black stone. Were they, were they not guilty? Throw in the white one. And so the person who was not guilty, who was acquitted, would be given the white stone. There are secret societies today that if you choose to join them and they don't like you, they will put you in a black stone, a black ball. And you would be black balled because you're not accepted. They don't trust you, which is probably a good thing because you don't need to be involved with that anyways. <laughs> Jesus is the light of the world. Everything else is darkness. Jesus is the only light. There is no other light other than Christ. Everything else is demonic. We don't need to be following that. But this white stone was a stone of purity. And it was a, a sign of acquittal. You are not guilty. And you are holy in the sight of the Lord. It was a special thing. And the fact that it's got a new name written on it that only Jesus knows. That's a personal message to that individual. Would it be given to everybody in that church? It's conditional. It's conditional only for the person who overcomes. They would be given the white stone that had a name on it that nobody knew except for Jesus. They would be not guilty. They could either follow the teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans and fall off into this idolatry, or they could be faithful to Jesus. They could repent. They could, they could live lives of holiness and purity. And that's Jesus' message to that church and to this one. I don't know about you guys, but I want our church to be a church where the Lord is honored. I don't want any sort of idolatry here. I, I want to be very careful. I don't want to be legalistic, but I want to be very careful about the things that we approve of and allow to be here. And if somebody comes and says, you know, I do this as well, we really need to be careful about what we accept. We need, we need to screen it by the word of God. You know, I know, and, and again, I mean, it's Easter time, and I know a lot of churches are having Easter egg hunts. I'd be very careful about that too, because that's pagan worship. I'm not saying little kids shouldn't be running around there and finding stuff. But you know, in the Passover Seder, they would go and find the Ophigamen. They would go and find the hidden piece of bread. And it was pointing to Christ as opposed to pointing to some pagan worship. So we can, we can do stuff that follows the Lord and still have, have a good time together. We don't have to look like the world. We don't have to be seeker sensitive. We have to honor God and the Lord can add to the church daily such as should be saved. That's just my opinion on it. But Jesus says, here's my, here's my standard. I want you to repent. Not to follow man, but to follow Christ. So that's his message. Somewhere in there, I think, is a message to us. The sad part is his Pergamum's not there anymore. Not like it once was. God did bring judgment. What will he do here? My hope is that he'll continue to bless but it, it depends on each one of us following close to Christ. The, the sin and life of every single member affects each one of us. Each one of us. And if we tolerate this kind of garbage that they were tolerating, Jesus is going to be like, hey, I'm coming quickly. I'm removing that lampstand. Because I honestly believe this. It would be better off for a church not to exist in a community. For there to be no faulty gospel witness than for there to be a church that proclaims the name of Jesus, that goes out there and openly accepts and promotes and tolerates and embraces immorality like is being in our culture and was in that culture. Because that is far worse. Because they're misleading people off into sin. And we should not do that. The Lord is going to bring great judgment on them. And I think about it a lot. You know, Jesus says... Woe to them who hurt little children. You know, it'd be better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck than for, for them to hurt one of these little ones. We don't, we don't want to mislead anybody. I, I want to see this place full of little kids who love Jesus. I want to see them healthy and be this, this be a place of, of vibrant life where people can have, you know, holy lives because they're honoring God and they're not getting involved with stuff they shouldn't be getting involved with. I think we can learn a lot from what Jesus is saying here.